Hey there, welcome to Board Game Hot Takes. My name's Tim. And this is Chris. This is Adam. And today we're going to be giving our hot take review on the game we just finished playing, Architects of the West Kingdom. We'll also be talking about some games that have been on our table, including two recent expansions for Distilled, as well as Guards of Atlantis 2. But before we get into all of that, we're going to be talking about some poll results. As always, I ask on social media a poll question. I asked this on our Blue Sky account as well as our Facebook group. And the question I asked this week was, what do you do when everyone cancels on game night at the last minute? Now, I have to give some context here. A couple of weeks ago, I have my weekly game night. Usually, I have about three to four people show up out of a group of eight. I don't know why we can't get better results than that, but come on, guys. Let's, let's pull it together. Usually, I have three to four, and that night, only one person could make it. And about an hour before... He said, I'm sorry, I had some work come up. I got to cancel on you tonight. So it hit me. This has happened in the past. It's been a little while, though. And I was just curious what other people did when you are excited about game night. You got everything planned. You got the, the game set up on the table. You've relearned the rules and you're ready to get into it. And then everybody cancels. What do you do? The options I gave on the poll, number one, it's solo game time. Got 43%. Sulk got 12%. Move on, change of plans, got 43%, and I ain't too proud to beg, got 2%. What do you guys say about this one? I am probably a little bit of all of those answers, a little bit of all of the above. There's probably going to be some sulking, and oh, my friends are the worst, and then I'm probably going to go <laughs> play some solo game. Probably I'd be one of the ones flaking out on game night more than more likely than anything. I'd be the one calling you up, Tim. I can't make it tonight. Sorry, my daughter just threw grape juice all over the floor. I got to clean it up. I don't know. I come up with something. I'm not sure what I do. What about you, Chris? Uh, change of plans. You know, I'll move on. I'll go find a TV show to watch or something like that. I always love hanging out with my family. So if it doesn't work out for game night, then I'm I'm happy to go hang out with them. And this actually did happen to me just a few weeks ago. And I was so sad because my Thursday night game group, I've never hosted it yet. I'm the new guy in the group. They've been doing this for like 15 years and I've only been with them for like a year and a half. And so finally I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to try to host this time. And so, you know, I got some drinks, I got some snacks, I got everything set up. I'm like all ready to go. And then one by one folks were like, yeah, you know, I got to work late or that was actually a week of particularly bad weather coming. So people were getting freaked out about the weather. And so a couple people bailed out. Another one was feeling a little bit sick and I didn't take any of it personally because this happens all the time. I mean, there's the occasions when the game night gets canceled and people have all kinds of reasons they don't show up on a particular time. But I was so bummed out because I was looking forward to having everybody over to my pad. And it did make me a little bit sad. But actually, one guy did show up and we ended up having a great time. It just ended up being a one-on-one night. And we had a lot of fun. Well, at least you got somebody to show up for the game night. With some interesting responses, uh, I'll be reading some comments in a few minutes here. And it felt like every one of them hit something that I've done in the past. Like, I still remember the first time this happened. I think, Chris, you were one of the two people that canceled on me. And I had, this was way back. This was like six years ago. And I had Lords of Waterdeep set up on the table with the expansion. And I was all excited to mm. get into this great game. And you guys canceled. And I think it was the first time I went online and I found a, a solo variant for the game. And I taught myself how to play. But I still remember being so like disappointed. And my wife's like, what are you? Are you are playing that board game by yourself? I was like, it's game night. I'm going to play a game. Dang it. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Chris, it wasn't the only time it happened. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for multiple times. <laughs> I guess. I we should go back to the whole conversation about how people treat game night like it's optional. Like you don't do that if you're on a bowling league or you're on a tennis doubles league. It's a commitment. You go to it. And then people think you can just cancel on game night willy nilly. I don't understand that mindset. I, that doesn't make sense to me. Anyway, this last time, uh, it actually worked out just fine. My wife and daughter, my wife wanted to go out to dinner, which she really is like the one who's choosing for us to go out and eat a meal somewhere. There was like a charity thing at, at some restaurant that night. So it was fun. I had a, a fun night out going out with my family. But um, yeah, usually I'll, I'll I, it's like if, I, if it's supposed to be game night, it's going to stay game night in some way. I'll either try to convince my wife to play a game with me or I'll, I'll bust a solo game out. Anyway, here's what some people said on our poll comments on Blue Sky. Bays and Bob said, I punch and sword another game that's on my shelf of shame that may or may not get played next game night. Well, that's good. Yeah, stick, stick in the hobby a little bit. Do something else related to it. That's fun. Nice. Jesse Florig said, solo game night. Occasionally, I can sway my partner into pity game night for two. <laughs> Lahav, Ark Nova, and Darwin's Journey are my current favorite solo games. That's cool. 
getting into solo games is not bad. I'm just having less fun playing solo games lately. I don't know what it is. I think my attention span is just getting worse as I'm getting older or something like that. So it's harder for me to sit down and just focus on a solo game and have fun with it. So over on Facebook, Rick Burkowski said, BGA time. And that's kind of what happens to me a lot. I'm like, okay, nobody showed up. Let me go see what games are waiting for yeah. gameplay. And then I end up sitting, clicking through BGA for a couple hours. Dan Monta said, if game night gets canceled, I usually try to stay in game mode by painting minis to games I want to get to the table in the coming weeks. It's a good excuse to break out the airbrush and paints. Another hobby related thing to do if you don't get to do your game night. That's a great idea. Steve Colgrave said, solo while sulking. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I do appreciate, by the way, how much BGA has changed the whole face of this because it's always game time on BGA, right? I mean, anytime you got five spare minutes, even, you know, unless there's something else that really preempts it, it's always a good time to go on BGA and take a few turns, right? Yeah, I love that. But I also kind of, I'm not sure I do because I think that's what's killing my like solo experience because it's like, Mm. oh, if I'm sitting here for five minutes, wait, let me check to see if there's a turn on BGA. And then it's like, I don't, Mm. I'm having a harder time focusing on you know, other activities because BGA is so easy to just like pull me in and sit down and and do that, which is fun. It's great. I get to experience a lot more games, but I'm not sure it's a, I'm not sure it's a good thing. Hmm. To me, the, the solo thing is almost like a luxury. Like I now have the time to sit down and set up this game and enjoy the little intricacies and methodicalness and going through the rules and not having to rush for anybody. Nobody's want me to help them with whatever i don't have to do work on the house i'm gonna take a little break and i'm gonna care about me for the next half hour 45 minutes so it's a luxury and not one that i often have but i'm looking forward to that day when i will have some time to sit down and do a little solo action adam practicing a little self-care i appreciate that that's right (laughs) i keep telling myself that's that's my retirement at some point like at some point i'm gonna have a lot of free time and nothing like pulling me in different directions that's when all these solo games I've been stocking up on my shelves are going to pay off. There you go. All right. And David Rodriguez said, I picked move on, change of plans. And that plan is revenge. If people want to cancel my birthday <laughs> or I'm donating Oregon, I desperately need. That's one thing. But canceling game night, some wrongs require vengeance. <laughs> well, <laughs> nice. Nicely said. I agreed. I like it. Agreed. I like it. And Chris, vengeance is still coming for you. Oh, my Oof. goodness. <laughs> when you least expect it, expect it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's jump into a game description for Architects of the West Kingdom. In Architects of the West Kingdom, you play as architects trying to please the king by architecting and building buildings in your city, while also contributing to the construction of the Great Cathedral. Your team of workers will recruit assistants that give you ongoing benefits or will collect resources. And the more workers you send to an action, the stronger it becomes. But we worry about sending too many workers to take an action because your opponents may hire thugs to capture your workers and can collect money by sending them to prison. If you don't want to work too hard, just go to the black market and get goods at a discount, but you'll lose reputation, and in medieval France, you don't want to be frowned on by the church. The player count will determine how many buildings have to be built to end the game, and then players will get points based on the cathedral track, reputation track, points for building cards, and they'll lose points for workers in prison. Architects of the West Kingdom was designed by Shem Phillips and Sam McDonald and was published by Garfield Games. All right, so let's jump into the gameplay and mechanisms here, but I do want to call out that this was my third play of Architects of the West Kingdom. I played two times in person, and I think this was Chris and Adam's first play tonight. That's right. This is my first play, Tim, but I had a blast playing it. I was going to call out my favorite mechanism of the game or what I want to talk about first, but I think Chris has something to say. Yeah, I have a question. This is probably the most important question we're going to address tonight. And is it Garp Hill or Garfil? Because I've heard it both ways. And even watching the instruction video from Rodney Smith, he said something kind of non-committal like, Garfield games. <laughs> and I, I, I couldn't tell. Well, admittedly, I don't know for sure. I'm going to, I've always called it Garfield. That seems right to me, but I'm going to ask Sam or Shem to chime in on our social media and let us know the right way to say it. If it's Garfield, just give me a thumbs up. If it's, if it's Garpill, a heart will be fine. We need to know this. Yeah. We need to know this. All right. So back to the game, Architects of the West Kingdom. This is what part of this series of some sort of occupation of the cardinal direction. I don't know what you call it. Kingdom sub phylum class <laughs> order. I'm going, I'm going the animal kingdom. here. Anyway, the mechanism I liked in this game that added a lot to the player interaction of this game was that being able to capture 
other players workers i thought that was a neat twist on a worker placement game it made it fun it made it so much fun just this little mechanism so what you can do you can go to this little town center with one of your little guys and then you can that allows you to swoop up a group of any other players characters at one location on the board or if you have two guys there you can pick up two different groups at one location three guys three different groups and so on and so forth and then later on you can sell those dudes to the prison for a dollar a piece so it's part of the core mechanic of this game to swoop up others' peoples and to get money for them, which you use for doing other stuff in the game. So I thought that just that little piece right there added so much interaction, so much fun. And it wasn't even, a, it wasn't painful. It didn't hurt that bad. Everybody's going to do it to everybody else in order to get a little extra money so you can do more moves. So I love that part of the game. I love that too. And I thought it was actually kind of hilarious and weird. And I don't quite entirely understand the thematic connection there. I mean, it's like you're sending out the posse (laughs) to like go round up somebody else's people or round up your own people and then get some ransom for them. A little ransom never hurt nobody, right? I mean, this is, no, I, I completely agree, Adam, that this was one of, to me at least, exactly two mechanics in this game that really set it apart that weren't just kind of standard issue worker placement. That was one of them. And what a hoot it was. Oh my goodness. I mean, the first time that I went to the town center and snatched up somebody else's people, it felt so good. (laughs) And it's also this like built in control mechanism where, you know, the more people you put on a space and you keep building it up over time, the more powerful those actions get. Till you know, you let somebody go for too long and they're getting five, six, seven, eight, whatever stones every time they take a turn. So you got to take them down. I mean, you have to, you know, take them away, take that away from them. And maybe you get a few coins in the process. So it was actually a really, a really fun dynamic yeah. being able to do that. Yeah. And I didn't get too specific on the rules, but the key is that this is a worker placement game where nobody blocks other people. When you go to a space, you can keep adding workers there every turn and that space gets stronger and stronger. So like Chris said, it's a really important control mechanism because not only do you get some benefit if you capture them and turn them in later, but you got to stop Adam from getting 15 bricks on that space. He can't get 15 bricks mm-hmm. per turn. So we got to block them. So there, it's it's one of the rare worker placement games where you have to interact. You have to be paying attention to what other people are doing and stop them from doing it. Which is almost makes this not a worker replacement game since it's fun. It's crazy. (laughs) Go go back to our dictionary episode. We talk about worker replacement. And I think you guys said it involves some kind of blocking or prioritization. In this game, there is no like blocking. It's a free for all until you're going to, until somebody gets too many guys there and then you snatch them all away. So I don't know. Is this a worker placement game? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, it still does. There's still a control mechanism. Yeah. There's still a limitation. And the limitation may be imposed by another player, but it's still a limitation. So it may be a little bit of a variation on it. But I think Tim actually brought this one up on that episode. He talked about this and made that argument. Okay. I don't know. I, it feels worker placement D to me. Yeah. And so the other thing that I think is really interesting here, I, I think a fun system to play around with and my three plays of it, I keep messing around with the system. I haven't got it figured out yet and it's this reputation system it's the idea that you can gain reputation in this game and if you do once you have a certain amount of reputation you can no longer use these black market spaces and these are very powerful spaces so you've kind of lost that opportunity but if you use the black market spaces you lose reputation and eventually if you lose enough reputation you can no longer build on the cathedral which is a great scoring opportunity so you want to kind of be in the balance, but also the higher you get, the more points you get. If you get too low, you lose points, but you also don't have to pay as much tax. So it's an interesting trade-off. And so far, I keep trying to go the disreputable route, and it hasn't paid off for me, although I did a little better this game. I took a close third sp- third place in this one. But I think it's a fun system, and it, and it feels thematic. It feels it, it's, a, it's an entertaining part of the story, I tell myself when I'm playing the game. This reminded me a little bit of one of Tim's other favorite games, The Path of Light and Shadow. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> except, here, <laughs> except here, the system worked magnificently. You have that reputation tracker on the left where you go higher up, and that's better, and then lower down, that's worse. And if you get too high, yeah, it eliminates some of the actions you can do. Too low eliminates some of the other actions you can do. Right in the middle, you have a balance. You can do anything you want. And then you can kind of pick as the game goes on. So what a cool mechanism where you have to kind of choose, am I going to be good or bad? And it has pretty significant consequences and it's very thematic. And I love how they implemented that system too. Yeah, so this was the other of the 
two mechanisms I was mentioning that really make this game stand out. And I like this also. It was a lot of fun and it was thematically so cool because you're you're showing what kind of person you're going to be. You're showing whether you're going to be the good upstanding citizen that the church can be proud of, or are you going to be the underhanded underworld guy who's going to get a bunch of free stuff? Honestly, I started this one thinking, man, I'm going to be like rocking this reputation track because I want to have all those points associated with it. And I want to be able to build in the cathedral. And I've got this guy who lets me spend a rock to move up on that track. I was just at that point where you couldn't go to the black market anymore. And I was feeling pretty good about myself. And I was like, but dang, there's something I really want in the black market. And so I did it. And then after that, I was like, whoa, there's $13 at the tax collector's office. And so I went and got that. And the next thing you know, I'm right there dead center in the middle of this thing. Lost my reputation, but I got a bunch of good stuff. <laughs> it, was a, it's a, it was a fun choice a very fun choice to be made with this track. Yeah. The other thing I want to mention about the game is that I think the whole West Kingdom trilogy by Garfield Games, one of the things I really like about it is that a lot of the 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 engine building in it or even kind of the choices you make are are card driven. And this is no exception. There's these assistant cards you can recruit over the course of the game or that maybe they're called recruits, but basically they have a variety of different benefits. Usually they're going to give you benefits for different spaces or things like that. And it feels like every time I played this game, it was like a completely different little engine I could build. And the market is huge. There's always eight cards in it, but you have to pay more for cards to the right. And so it's a variety of choices. It's going to maybe drive your strategy or maybe what assistant you're picking up is going to drive your strategy because the assistants also give you a certain type of tool symbol, which you may need in order to build some of the buildings. And that's the other card driven engine building. A lot of these buildings have either immediate effects or end game scoring points. And so depending on what buildings you're working towards and you build, then all of a sudden you've got a new goal to try to work towards towards the end of the game. And Paladins of the West Kingdom did this really well as well, both the, the adding the kind of the engine building piece, but also the end game scoring piece. I loved it in both games. And I think it's, you know, I just, it's so fun. It, it's going to give you variety, even though the basic game board is always the same, that those card markets and the cards that you can pick up, change it up. I love it. Yeah, the card market was cool here, Tim. The way you described it was like a Pax Premier card market. And that's exactly what it was. You have two rows of cards and then you can go further down the column. If you add a coin to the preceding cards, if you wanted to you know go out and get that card from the third spot that was extra helpful for whatever little engine you're trying to build. And those were great. It didn't seem overly, you know, crucial to the game, but they would add this nice little touch like, hey, this guy works out nice. Give me a few points here and I can add to my little engine that I'm building so that next turn I can do this and this and this. And just the whole feel of the game, Steve mentioned it, there's no rounds. You're just going and going and going around and around and around. I love these kind of games where there's no reset or no production phase like terraforming mars it's nice you eventually have that production phase and a nice kind of pause but here you're just going around and around and around i don't know how we went from card market to going around 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 but (laughs) i'm there and i really enjoyed that kind of non-stop feel of this game yeah I i did too and i guess i'll just kind of offer my last thought on this part to say that the rest of this game felt like absolute normal run of the mill worker placement you got cards that either gave you a little benefit or you got other cards that let you build a building by get you know with a bunch of resources and then you go to a space to get a resource you go to a space to get a card you go to it just felt like a lot of the very very similar things so i almost feel like you know the rest of that i don't need to say much about it because it's so standard worker placement that it really is those other things that we were talking about before the reputation track and the ability to snatch up other people's players, your other people's workers, that really did make this game stand out. Although I'm going to take that back and say there was one other thing that did make this one stand out. And I thought this was absolutely delightful. It was how quickly this game went. Yeah. It's almost like the antidote for, oh, I forget the name of it. Was it Wayfarers of the South Tigers? Of the South which Tigers. just felt like yeah. a game so overburdened with complexity and cards everywhere and this one man what a breezy light tim said before we started this game he said we'll be done with it in about an hour and i said you're insane there's no way we're gonna be done with this thing in an hour and sure enough maybe an hour and 15 minutes even though none of us had ever played it before but you were taking these turns lightning fast it felt like we were just going through this thing so quickly and yet all of the decisions were interesting and fun 
I think the only turn of the game that I felt was a real letdown in a lousy turn was actually my last turn of the game, which was I ran out of workers, so I had to take a turn to take a worker back. That was my fault. That wasn't the game's fault. But other than that, I felt like every turn I was doing something fun and interesting. Yeah, I somehow I managed to set myself up for the exact same last turn of the game, even though I was the one that triggered the end of the game. <laughs> I just forgot that I didn't have any workers left. I think that's the key of the game is that it is for a for a very light and easy to teach and easy to get into game. It plays quick. There's no maintenance. There's no rounds to like clean up a bunch of stuff and reset everything and pull back workers. It just keeps going. I taught this to a group of three other players who were more casual players last week, and they all had a blast playing it. They all got into it quickly. We are all having the fun like table talk about stealing other people's workers and stuff like that. And it just plays so quick, like Chris mentioned. So you want an hour, hour, 15 minute game with four to five players. It feels like you've got a decent weighty game. It just goes slick. So I really like this. I think four to five players is the way to go here. I have played it at three and if and it lacked a little bit of that interaction. I'm going to be trying it at two with my wife soon and we'll see how that goes. But I think four to five players, this is, this is kind of a go to like, you know, midweight game for four to five players. You make a good point, Tim. I think the more players here, the better it's going to be because of that interaction. This game, you know what this game felt like to me? And I want to see what Chris says about this. This game felt like Hansa Teutonica to me. <laughs> Quick, you're going around. It's snappy little moves, a little bit of engine building. I feel like this is how Hansa Teutonica is supposed to feel. But this game, I mean, I had a lot more fun playing this game than Hansa Teutonica, to be honest with you. And I'm sure Chris is going to say something similar. What are your thoughts on that, Chris? I don't know. I played Hansa Teutonica once and remembered hating it. Um, I don't actually remember enough about the details of the game to tell you why. But uh, so I don't know that I can yeah. compare the two. Uh, but I guess the the critical thing, and I guess you know we're a hot take show, right? So I will say that after one play of each of these, I had a really fun time playing this game. I had a really sad time playing Hansa Teutonica. <laughs> and also, this is the first podcast episode where. Architects of the West Kingdom was ever compared to Hansa Teutonico in detail. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we got that going for us. All right, well, let's jump into the theme and production of Architects of the West Kingdom. Classic Garfield production. You got the iconography that's familiar if you've played any of the games before. You got the same artwork that makes these games all blend into one mega monotone type game for me. So really theme and production don't do much for me with any of the Garfield games. So that's about where I stand. It's simple. And I think it's in a small box. Tim could talk more about that. So that's nice that they isn't overburdened with a chunky box of air. But uh, nothing remarkable for yeah. theme and production for me. Yeah, I feel kind of the same way. I mean, it's got a board. It's got a bunch of meeples. Uh, it's got the art. I mean, I think the art is really the thing that you have to you know hang your hat on for this game if you're either liking it or disliking the production. And just my own personal taste, the art by Mahalo Dmitrievsky, who I believe did pretty much all the art in all of the games in this series. It's just not my cup of tea. It's a little bit odd. The people kind of look funny in, in a way that I don't find appealing. But that's not to say it's bad. I mean, it's definitely it's a very distinct style. And I could also just as easily see myself really liking it and really enjoying it if my tastes were just slightly different. So I do appreciate the fact that it's very distinctive and that's kind of cool. Uh, it's just, it, I find it a little bit distracting because the people are so freaking weird looking, <laughs> but <laughs> other than that, I have, I have no real complaint about it. Yeah. I mean, it's for me, I I'm a little the opposite of you guys. Like I actually dig the style to it. And I think it's kind of welcoming to come back to their, this series of games and feel like the iconography is the same. And it's very clear. I think the, the graphic design on all of these Wex, West Kingdom games are very clear. They use really nice, sharp art iconography for all the symbols, but then the characters themselves are just kind of goofy, like a dark comical look to them. And it, it is a weird style, but I enjoy it. And I, I think I, there's like some nice color in all of these games. They've got nice colored components and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, it's a tiny little box. And I, you can find this almost anywhere for like 32 to 35 bucks. And it's a small box with a bunch of wooden components. And there are a bunch of, you know, big stacks of cards, nice boards. I think for the price, you can't really get much better from a production perspective here. But again, like Chris and Adam said, the art style is very unique and, and you know, kind of bizarre. So it, it I think it's going to hit for some people and not for others. Now, Chris, you liked the Miko's art in Endless Winter, if I remember right, even though it's a very similar style. So it is interesting how 
even though it's like really the same style, maybe it's the theme that that didn't hit as much here? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. Actually, I didn't realize it. But now thinking back to the art from Endless Winter, I can I can see that. I'm not really sure how to how to reconcile those two. So I and really, I think on this one, you know, th- it's such a matter of personal taste that nobody should take my suggestion about the art as being, you know, that it's good or it's bad. It's just not. Yeah, this this one was not to my taste. But it's it's very striking. I'll say that it's striking. And whether it strikes you <laughs> good or bad uh, is really going to depend on how you feel about the specifics. Before we go final thoughts, I was going to ask, we talked about it during the game and I made a little joke about it earlier, but there's like a North series and a West series. And I think there's a South series. Yeah. It started with the North Seas trilogy, which is based in like Scandinavia, you know, kind of Viking era. And then it's the West Kingdom series came next. And that's all set in France, you know, basically a Western European kingdom. And then there is the South Tigris series, which is set in like Northern Africa. And so that's in the works right now. I think the second of those two games or the second of those three games have been released. And I know they're going to be coming out with a East series, although I don't remember if they've announced what the specific title is there. And we were talking about this. I was saying to me, it kind of makes them all somewhat a slightly indistinguishable. Like there's something of the North and something of the East. And I don't know what mm. else of the West, but you're making the point, Tim, that maybe that's a, a bonus for some people. They want to collect the series and they're like, oh yeah, I want to get the whole set from yeah. each direction. What's the point you were making on that? Because it was, you made that point. I was like, oh yeah, that is a good point. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, for one, if you are a fan of the of the artwork and the whole presentation and kind of like, you know, like I think where it really kicked off, I mean, they had done the the first game in the North Sea. Yeah. They'd done the first game in the North Sea trilogy that got a little attention. And then when Raiders of the North Sea came out, that was a very unique worker placement game for the time. So that got some good acclaim and, you know, really, I think escalated Garfield games at the time. And I think once you kind of fall in love with one of these games and you're like, oh, I want to try the next one. And I've fallen into that. Like I liked Raiders of the North Sea. I never tried the other ones in the North trilogy, but then I got into um, Paladins of the West Kingdom and I really loved that game. And then I got into Viscounts of the West Kingdom and loved that. So I was like, yeah, I want to try Architects of the West Kingdom. So I kind of fell into that. Like I'm digging what these people are doing in this little t- small box, kind of, you know, nice, heavy midweight Euro games in these small boxes. So I think there is a kind of a reputation that gets built. If you like this series of games, you might like the next game in the series. So there's a value to Gar- for Garpill to do that. But I think like Adam said, there's also the, the, the problem is that it starts to become indistinct. And if you're coming into it from the outside, like which game do I start with? Why do I play any of these games? Because I don't want to play all of them without knowing them. Yeah. And I played this one game, but I don't remember which one it was. Which was it in the West series? Was it in the Easters? So I think it kind of gives up a little bit of its identity by being almost too repetitive. But at the same time, it's like the MCU. Probably somebody who's not into Marvel doesn't care about any of the yeah. movies, and it almost turns them off because there's too many of them now. Versus the people that are all into it are going to be like, "Hey, the next MCU movie's out. I want to check that out." So I think there's maybe a, a good connection there. I think that we we played another one of these games at uh, the first Portland Con, and honestly, I don't remember which one it was. Viscounts, Vi- yeah, yeah, that was Viscounts of the West Kingdom. Okay. Chris. yeah, that's right. Yeah, but that was after, and I think you you seem to enjoy it. Okay, but I think that was after your first game in the. Tr- well, you played um, Wayfarers. I, we played the a long time ago. You and I played the North Seas one, and then we played that's right. Wayfarers for the show. Wayfarers of the South of the South yep. Tigers, and you did not no. like that one at all. No. So I think you had like your first inter- introduction to it was kind of a negative introduction. And so I think that probably carried through a little bit to you when when we played Viscounts, I felt like you went in kind of already like turned off by the by the look and the feel. Maybe it was because of the first game, maybe it's just because it just didn't attract you. But I think just like it is for somebody who was drawn into the first game they played and now wants to play more, if you're turned off by the first game, you're not going to want to play anymore because they look exactly the same. They, you know, you think they're going to play the same, even though they're kind of fairly distinct mechanisms across the board. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say just fairly distinct. I would say in fairness to the series, they do not feel anything alike. I mean, I can remember playing Wayfarers and having a pretty negative reaction to that one, but there was, that was nothing like Viscounts and Viscounts felt nothing like this. So they are truly distinct games. And I have very different opinions on all three of them, but you know, 
folks should not uh, mistake mistakenly believe that this is just a you know retreads of the same game over and over again. Yeah, and that's sort of where I was at too. And moving into my final thoughts, I think the only other game I played was at your place, Tim. We played Paladins. Is that right? Paladins. Yeah, that's right. And I had a decent enough time playing that one, but this one I absolutely loved. And going into this, I was like, here we go, another Garfield games. It's going to be the same old stuff and it's going to be kind of boring resource management, move some cubes around and get some stuff. No, this one was an absolute blast. Really love the interaction here. Super light rules overhead. We got into it. We were having fun right off the bat, snappy turns. It was, you look up and it's your turn again, unless Steve is telling some story about uh, some <laughs> music band that he couldn't find. <laughs> but even when that was happening, I was still having a great time playing the game. Steve loved it too. Would happily request to play this one again and look forward to play, playing this one again. So those are my thoughts on, I think it's Architects. Is that right? <laughs> Architects and, and sh- shocking thoughts, to be honest, for Adam to rave about a worker placement game. I'm like my whole world just got turned upside down. <laughs> yeah, and I think I'm going to say nearly the same thing as what Adam just did. I did not go into this game with high expectations. Even after watching the rules description, I did not have particularly high hopes for this game. But by the time we got a round or two in, I just felt myself having more and more fun. And the fact that it's kind of basic worker placement with these couple of real standout mechanisms, I think is actually not a bad thing. I mean, some of it's going to be very familiar to players. You know, you put your your guy in the mines and you're going to get a rock. You know, that that's all fine. You get the added benefit of the more workers you put there, the more rocks you get. But then you get the opportunity to you know steal other people's characters, all of that, the player interaction. I think that probably, like Adam mentioned, was one of the high points of this, was that it felt like, real player interaction, a little bit of aggression. I mean, even more than just blocking somebody out, you could actually go and, you know, go kidnap their people. I mean, that, that's kind of cool. So, and you wrap all that up in a package of a game that you can blast through in an hour. And it was a really nice experience. I had a great time playing this game. So far, it's my my favorite of the the larger series by far. And I would happily play it again. And I am pretty sure I will be asking to play this one again. I'm BGA, if nothing else. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great thing as we can. It is on Board Game Arena. So, you know, the four of us can get in and jump in another game regularly. Uh, yeah, I really like Architects of the West Kingdom. I, I asked to play this tonight because I got a chance to play a four player game of this with some friends last weekend and just had a blast with it. And I knew that Adam and Chris would like the interaction. I knew Chris would like, of course, the first person he steals all the workers from his mind. (laughs) I'm glad you guys enjoyed it because I think it's kind of a standout for these fairly straightforward midweight worker placement games. There's a lot of them out there. I've kind of been rotating some through my collection. And right now, this is, I think, my top. This and Pan Am are going to stick in my collection, I think, for right now. Mm. But I think everything else that's kind of of this same simple wait one hour hour 15 play time these are the this this is one of the two that's going to stick around for me i wanted to try it and i was at a little local con about a year and a half ago and this was in their library so i busted out i learned it from the rule book in about five minutes because i had to rush and teach it and i really enjoyed it but it, it felt like the game went really quick and i was like i think I, I think this is a great game but i don't know maybe maybe a next play get redundant and so I, I found it at a local seller's market for 20 bucks. I was like, I got to try this again. And then it just sat in my collection for six months and I was almost ready to move it out. I was like, I haven't played this. I don't think anyone's asking for it, but I had four people get together and let me give it a try. And it worked out so much fun. That's why I asked for it again tonight. And I'm so glad you guys liked it as well. So this one will be sticking around. I, I think there's a lot of opportunity to bust this out when you have a mid-length amount of time with four to five players. It's going to be great. All right. Well, that will wrap up the conversation on Architects of the West Kingdom. We'll be talking about some games that have been in our table right after this. Welcome back. What have you guys been playing recently. I have had on my table this week two new expansions, which I believe are on pre-order right now for the game Distilled, 
uh, designed by Dave Beck and published by Paverson Games. For the record, Paverson Games did send me copies for review of both of these expansions. And I'll go through them each separately because they both do kind of different things. For those who haven't played Distilled before, don't know much about it, please go listen to our review episode. We reviewed this not too long ago. And I think everybody really enjoyed the game. And in fact, when we did our recent 2023 awards, I listed Distilled as the best new to me game in 2023. So it was definitely at the top of my list for for great games that came out in 2023. I really enjoy this one, have played it a bunch of times. And I think overall, Distilled is a great game. So let me talk a little bit about the expansions. The first one is called the Cask Strength expansion. And this is a mini expansion. It's nothing but a little deck of cards. And really, the main things that it does is it adds more cards to the existing decks that already are there in the game. It adds a few new distillery upgrades. Those are upgrades that give you an ongoing benefit for your distillery that let you you have some superpower that stays with you for the rest of the game once you purchase the upgrade. There were some new ingredients, which I'll come back to. And there were some new items. Items are things like barrels and bottles that you can use when you're generating or selling your spirits and usually add some kind of a point bonus. There's also an entirely new set of ingredients cards in there. And the difference between this set of ingredients cards and the old ingredients cards really comes down to new powers on the cards. In other words, So one of the things that you're trying to do is get different kinds of sugars to use for different spirits that you might want to distill. And so you might have a fruit sugar. So in the new set of cask strength ingredients, you might, for example, have a fruit card, a fruit sugar that says for every other fruit sugar in your final product, you get an extra dollar in income for it. So it really was that. And it was, that was a pretty standard thing from card to card and it invited you to take out the old set of ingredients of premium ingredients entirely and replace those with the new set. Or if you wanted to, you could mix and match them a little bit, but they suggested not going beyond a certain level of mixing the two. So didn't do anything tremendously different, just added a little bit more stuff. The one mechanism difference that the cask strength expansion does add is what's called the dynamic market. And it was a pretty simple upgrade. It reminded me a little bit of the one from Sulkin, which I'm I'm blanking on at the moment. But basically what it did was it predicted for you things that were going to change from round to round. So you would flip a card at the beginning of each round and it would tell you certain things are going to be more expensive this year. Certain things are going to be less expensive this year and certain kinds of spirits from different regions are going to be either worth more or worth less than they were on their standard pricing. So it's really trying to show you some market volatility in the world and how you will make more money, how you make less money, the things you might do to maximize. And then once you flip the card and you have the current year, the next card is visible to you. And so you'll also get a preview of what's coming the next year, even though it's not actually active yet. So that was one mechanism change that came with this. Other than that, it was really just adding a few more cards. Chris, before you get into the next expansion, now that events deck sounds really fun to me. It sounds like it's going to kind of force some variability into the game and make maybe change your strategy a little bit. What did you think of it? Did you en- did you enjoy playing with it or did you feel like it kind of threw off your game or threw too much randomness in? I felt like it added some variability. And I, I I'm, let me hold off on answering that question because I'm going to kind of go through at the end how my feelings on both of these expansions and what you ought to do about that. But it did, it did add some variability for sure. Okay. The other expansion that I got was the Africa and Middle East expansion. And this was another expansion that basically was more stuff. This one had a new set of recipe cards. It had a new set of goal cards. This one also added some distillery upgrades, some premium market ingredients, some premium item cards. So another one that did add a bunch of new material, but didn't change any of the mechanisms some things in the cards were a little bit different. So you had some wild sugars, for example, like a glucose syrup. But it was all stuff that, you know, you don't have to learn a new mechanism. You just look at the card and this one says you can use it as a wild for any kind of sugar. So it didn't really change a whole lot. It also added a few distillery uh, end game distillery goals that the players could work on. And it added some new characters. So 
let me talk a little bit about my feelings of both of these expansions. The Africa and Middle East expansion I actually thought was pretty entertaining because it it added a bunch of new material that was standard to the base game. So it added new characters, it added new spirits. And I think that's really interesting because I actually learned a bunch about several different spirits from Africa and the Middle East that I knew nothing about. And so even though it didn't add any new mechanisms, it added some new variability and added some stuff that's fun for me. Like I love the characters in this game. I've talked about that before, how I enjoy having the different people with their family recipes and they've each got a little story behind them about how they became a distiller. And I find that really entertaining. In terms of the cask strength expansion, it didn't add a whole lot other than a couple of those new cards. And then the thing that Tim mentioned, which was the the dynamic market. That was the only really new mechanism throughout both of these expansions. And it was okay. I didn't get blown away by it. My wife who played it with me actually didn't like it. She thought it added too much variability, a little bit more complexity. Her take on it was, this adds just enough complexity to it that it's got less fun for me. I did not feel that way. I don't think it added a ton, but I think it added something. And so my kind of overall take on both of these expansions were they are in no way necessary. They are certainly not ones where I'd say, well, I'd never play without that expansion or this other expansion. They are nice add-ons. If you're a fan of this game and you want something that's going to give you a little bit more variability, you're interested in the spirits and you want to have more variation that you know that you can pick in terms of the, the players, the different menu cards, things like that, then this is going to give you that extra variability. It's going to give you a little bit more, you know, sort of play time out of this game because you aren't, you're not going to see the same stuff coming over and over again. But overall, I'd say if you are a big fan or a super fan of this game, the stuff's probably worth the investment in particular, because they're not very expensive. The base game for distilled is about $80. The Africa and Middle East expansion is 20 and the cast strength expansion is 15. So these are not big dollar items. But if you're somebody who hasn't played this game before and you're not sure yet, I would say get the base game first. See if you really like it. And if you really do like the game, they'll still be there. Buy them later. Invest a little bit of money if you find yourself playing it enough that you're seeing the same stuff over and over again. So I'd say they were worthy expansions, but they didn't add a ton that was very unique. So worth it if you're a fan. If you're new to the game, start with the base game and see how you feel. Well, I'm a fan of Distilled, and this all sounds fun to me. So I do hope that the next time we all play, we play with all of this stuff mixed in. Uh, the replacing this the sugars for some more unique sugars that do different things, I think, is an mm-hmm. interesting idea as well. So I'm actually really excited to try these out. It sounds uh, like if you like a game, more stuff in it is good. So I, I yep. you know, that sounds fun to me. And I probably didn't hit this hard enough because I was talking about sort of like the substance of this, but I actually found all this fun because we have played it a number of times, our group, and I've played it a few times with my wife. I have played it with other friends as well. And I've played it enough times that having this extra variability is good. I actually really enjoyed it. And if I didn't have the copy that I got from Paverson, I would buy this. I think it's worthwhile. But that's because I'm a I'm a super fan. And it looks like that same great humor is here that they had in the base game. I'm looking at one of the tasting journal cards. This one is Sandy. And the notes are that it takes grit to taste through <laughs> all the flavors of this deposit. Nice. So I think that's fantastic. The same humor is here. That's off the website, by the way. You can see a few of these cards reinvigorating my desire to play distilled. Nice review. Yeah, yeah. it is funny that they even added more flavor cards in there since there's almost no reason to change that up, right? Like Those I are mean, great. They basically just, it's just for fun. They're, they're, the flavor card is just for flavor almost. Yeah. Well, these ones have a little, a little option. When selling, may replace one other card with a top card from the from the deck. So it gives you some little options okay, with the, cool. fla- so, the flavor cards as well. Yeah. Oh, that'll be fun. So if you draw one of those, then you get a little extra maybe bonus yep. once in a while. That's really cool. I like it. And that was kind of the vibe of this expansion. It took things that were already in the game and maybe added a little twist to it. So not big changes and nothing you'd have to like learn a new rule set. You just kind of look at the card and see what it says that's different. But that's why it was fun. It, it wouldn't be necessary if you don't know the game, but... It definitely helps if you're somebody who's played it a few times. And the other thing, again, that I thought was super interesting was just the the learning aspect of it. I mean, I'm looking at the list of spirits here that they added for this version of the game. And we've got Akpateshi, 
from Ghana. I have never heard of that before, but apparently it's, you know, a Ghanaian spirit that I'm I'm not familiar with or a rock or buka or grog. These are things that I was completely unfamiliar with. And now I feel like I've got a bunch of new uh, taste testers that I need to go out and experience for myself. I think, Chris, you're going to have to get us set up when we're in Long Beach together uh, when we're playing <laughs> distilled to try some new spirits. Maybe so. Cool. Well, what's been on my table this week is a game called Guards of Atlantis 2. This was published by Wolf Designer, and the designer's name is Artyom Nichiparov. Now, Guards of Atlantis 2 is a is made to be a tabletop version of a MOBA. And if you're a video game fan, you probably know what this means, but it basically stands for Multiplayer Online Battle Arena. A common MOBA a lot of people know is League of Legends. I played this years ago. My brother is really into it. He still plays it, but he invited me for a little while. So I got a little experience with it. Okay, I think you're going to go into it, Tim. But what if we don't know League of Legends or what a MOBA is? (laughs) How would you (laughs) describe that? Well, let me tell you very briefly with my very limited and outdated experience of what a MOBA is. Okay. If I remember, so League of Legends, the way it would work, it was real-time play. You're playing uh, teams. It's always like at least two people on a team. And you'd have two people on opposite sides of this kind of capture the flag style board. So you're each started a base and your characters have unique abilities, powers that they can use. In the middle of the board are these your minions. You've got these teams coming out of your base trying to go to the other side. And if they're just meeting in the middle the whole time, they're just killing each other and they never get to the other side. So you got to go in there and try to pick off some of these minions so that your minions can push through the tide of minions that are coming from the other side. And at the same time, your opponent's coming over, they're trying to kill off your minions and you guys can like try to kill each other at the same time. You'll go in and, you know, shoot fireballs at each other, or hit each other with an ax or whatever. But, you know, if you die, of course, then you get reset. You got to respawn. You got to build up your special powers and stuff. So you don't want to die if you can help it. That's the whole concept of it. Um, this board game basically reproduced my memory of what a MOBA is almost exactly. It's uh, So we played a four-player game. Apparently, this plays uh, four, six, eight, or ten players, so it can play up to ten, but it's a double-sided board on one side. I think it's the four- and six-player board, and the other side is eight and ten. So we played a four-player game. Each player has a hero. That's kind of your main character. And in the middle of the boards, there's there's basically like, you know, kind of a region on each side of the board that's like the capture the flag region. That's your base. And then there's a central part of the board where you, the battle kind of starts. There's a bunch of minions there at the start of the game. And then between that central region and your base, there's one other region. So the way it works is that you're going to play four turns and that's going to end a round. And the way you play a turn is everybody simultaneously takes one of their five starting action cards out of their hand, places it face down. When everyone's done that, you reveal them all and they all have an initiative number printed on them. And the initiative basically says who goes first, highest number goes first. So you then would, whoever's going to go first, they take their turn and the card is going to do some actions. There's some default, like basic actions you can take, like move, but usually they have some special ability, like you can attack something adjacent to you, or you can attack something with a ranged thing, or you can move extra far or a a variety of other things. The idea being that you're trying to kind of move in as quickly as you can to get close to these minions or maybe the other heroes and attack them and hopefully kill them or knock them out. Um, you're going to do this over four turns and everybody's going to you know, kind of take these turns. If somebody attacks you as a hero, some of your cards have a shield uh, icon on it, like a defense. So you can discard a card to, to block an attack, but you only have five cards. So you can only do that max of once per turn or per, per round. And there might be some opponent's abilities that will actually make you discard a card. So you might not ever be able to block. Or if you do, you might run out of actions you can take. So you might not even get your full four actions. You get in a round. When the round ends, you kind of look at the board state. And if the um, if if one of the teams has more minions than the other, you reduce the other minions in that space by the number of the majority in the space. And if there's no minions from the other team after that, then all of the minions from the team that's winning moves one space closer to the base. So that's kind of the deal, right? You're trying to take out more minions than the other person so that you can eventually kind of push your way to the other side. But when you move to that space closer to their base, everything respawns and they start with more minions there. So it's going to be a little bit of a back and forth. It's harder to push through that last space. One of the end game conditions is to push all the way to the opponent's base, then you win. But the other thing is you can um, basically deal four damage to the heroes and depending on the level of the hero, that's how much damage they take. So if you take out a hero in the first round, it's a level one hero, they lose one of their four life. And then, but if they if they get to a level two, which I'll explain in a second, then they would lose two life if you took them out. So it's really like you can kill heroes like three or four times 
you'll win the game if you if you kill your opponent's heroes at number of turns, or if you push all the minions to the other side. But there's a cool upgrade system in this too. You know, each of us had a unique starting deck, five cards to start with. When you kill a minion, you get some coins. If you kill a hero, you get some coins. At the end of the round, you get to spend coins to upgrade your cards. And after you get to a certain level of card, you know, a certain number of upgrades, then you can upgrade to higher level cards. So there's this cool little tech tree that you're basically replacing one of the five cards in your deck with a more powerful card in your deck. And then you can replace it with a more powerful card in your deck as you get higher. So it was really cool to see these kind of basic actions, a little bit variable to change into drastically variable actions by the end of the game. And people are doing super powerful actions and so it escalated there was a really cool arc to the game where it started people were doing stuff but then by the second or third round people are doing big stuff and then you know finally it blows up into the into a big turn guys this game was a blast i had so much fun playing this it was great because it was a team game where i didn't have to barely we we, you almost are not allowed to make strategy with your opponents like you can't discuss strategy once your cards have been revealed so it felt like playing a competitive game but you had somebody on your team that you were rooting for and you you were invested in what they were doing on their turn and how the other people were interacting with them. I really had fun with this game. We played one game, four players, so got to see four characters, but we played kind of the recommended starting characters. And I suspect that the other characters, there's like 21 characters in the box here. I suspect that many of the other characters are much more variable and much more like, you know, unique to play than these ones because these were the recommended starting ones, but they were all fun to play. And I would love to get back and try some other characters here. I had a fun time playing around with this little puzzle and the excitement of when my opponent played their their card and it turned out that they were going to go right after me and I get to get jump in and knock them out before they could take their turn. Super fun games, really, really fun. And I thought it really did recreate that MOBA style experience that I remember from playing League of Legends back in the day. Tim, I have a ton of questions for you. I'm going to start with, you say it's a team more game. How much of that is going on? Are you, are you able to set up your teammate? Are you, do you get a sense of like, oh, I think he's going to do this. So if I do this, that'll work together and kind of synergize. Like how much teamwork is actually happening? So the way that the round plays out is basically before you pick the card you play, you can talk with your teammate. Keep in mind that everything you say is public information. So if you talk with them out loud, you might be giving information away to the other player. So you might tell your teammate, hey, I think if we both like kind of come in here and we can both attack this hero and take them out, but they're going to hear that and they can be like, hey, I'm just going to go fast and jump backwards and move out of their way, right? So you can't really discuss strategy too much without giving things away, but you can discuss it a little bit if you want to. And then once you reveal your cards, so you know what everybody can do, you can't talk at all anymore. So you can't discuss the strategy, which I actually like, because then I get to make my own decisions and take my turn. But you are helping out your, you know, your your teammate, you're all helping them out, you might jump in there and kill off a hero that's about to come in and jump your teammate on. And once you see everybody's cards revealed, you can make some decisions about that. And some turns you can't really, you're kind of on the other side of the board. And all you can do is go and attack a minion, it doesn't matter what your teammates doing. But it was still fun in the way that team games can be fun that you're just you get to root for somebody you get to you know like when when they have a win it's a win for you as well and so that's the fun part about a team game without having to cooperate too much so it's a perfect type of team game for me do you win or lose as a team or is there also you get yeah. points so that you know even on the winning team there might be somebody who is the higher point getting person no no it's a it's a team you okay. win or lose as a team yeah there's not there's not there, there can be more than one here hmm. we were talking about it earlier we talked about Cerebria, the inside world, is one of the only other team games we've played. Yep. Can you recall playing any other team games? Have you played the Dune Uprising 3v3 version? Yeah, it does. Dune Imperium does have a 3v3. Uh, the, the Dune Imperium Uprising does have a 3v3, and I didn't try that one. I haven't played too many except for, like, there's a lot of traditional card games, like, you know, Hand and Foot I used to play, team game, or, like, Spades, Spades right? Spades. Yeah. And so, like, we, I've been playing Teach You a lot lately, and that gives you that same team experience yep. Of just like, hey, I'm going to do something. I hope my opponent's like thinking the same way I am or my, my teammate is thinking the same way I am. You know, so it's got that same kind of fun. I'm trying to help somebody, but I can't really talk about what we're doing. So do you get that sense? Like in spades, after you've yeah. traded cards with your teammate, you're like, aha, my teammate is short suited in this. Now I'm going to set him up. I'm going to ditch all these cards and he's just going to spade everything or whatever he needs to do. Do you get that kind of sense? Like that's what I'm looking for when I'm playing a team game where you can like actually set up your teammate. Yeah, you, you can. And I think it's going it, to evolve even more as you get to know, like if you were to play this several times and start to get to know what the characters do, because remember, you only have five cards. So if you played against somebody 
the next time you play against that same character, you're going to kind of know what they can do. And so that got to be a little bit fun as we got through the game and started to learn our, our teammates' abilities. You know, I could be like, okay, I know he's got a ranged attack. So if I can just move here and push the other hero within two spaces of him, then he can do that. But I've got to hope that he's got the same plan in mind. Okay. So you can kind of set yourself up to have a big successful turn. But then, of course, you're playing against your opponents as well, and they're starting to learn your cards. And they're like, ooh, is he going to do that thing or is he going to do this other thing? Because I want to get in and knock out these two minions with my special move. So, yeah, I think it definitely set us up for some of those fun, like, oh, Tony just made a bad move there. He just made a big mistake, and his teammate is like, oh, <laughs> God, I got to play with Tony again. Just kidding, Tony, by the way. He did great. He did great. <laughs> the one last thing about Guards of Atlantis, too, is that it has got an awesome production, tons of cool minis and everything, lots of great artwork on these cards. But it comes in a big, huge Kickstarter-style box. I think you can only get this on Kickstarter. I think they might be doing another edition of it with an expansion. If this sounds interesting to you, though, I got to tell you, we all had a blast with it. I didn't even really expect to that much, but I had a lot of fun with it. So if this style of game sounds fun to you, I'd check it out. It was very easy to get into, too. Not a lot of fiddly rules. It was taught to us in like five minutes. There were no real questions that came up super straightforward to play i think this is a game that anyone could jump into as long as you got an even number of players four or more anyone could jump into this and have a blast with it cool i'd love to try this one same yeah i'd absolutely love to try this one all right that will wrap up this episode of board game hot takes if you enjoy the show please rate and review us on apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts Uh, please follow us on our facebook group or on Blue Sky. If you need a Blue Sky invite, hit me up at tim at boardgamehottakes.com and be happy to send one to you. Until next week, take care, everybody. Good night, all. Bye-bye.